How's everybody doing? Uh, I'm going to start y'all out with a little joke here. And uh, it's called, Pastor, your sermon reminded me of the peace and love of God. It starts out after a very long and boring sermon. The parishioners file out of the church saying nothing to the preacher. And toward the end of the line was a, a very thoughtful person who always commented on the, the preacher's sermons. So he said, Pastor, today your sermon reminded me of the peace and love of God. So the pastor was thrilled. Uh, he was tickled to death. He said, you know, nobody's ever said anything about my preaching before. Tell me why. So the guy said, well, it reminded me of the peace of God because it passed all understanding. <laughs> <laughs> and the love of God because it didn't do it forever. <laughs> I thought y'all get a kick out of that. Okay, what we're gonna talk about tonight is getting understanding. And uh, I want you to ask yourself this question in your mind. Why is it so important that we have an understanding or we get an understanding of God's word? Just think about that for a minute. And uh, in my mind, we should get understanding of this word because it's from God. It's God's word, and we should get understanding of it. You know, and what could be more important to us or anybody else than understanding what the creator of the whole universe has to say to us? God's got a lot to say to us. And it's all right here. And we should have an understanding of this. And when we open up the Bible and we begin to read the word of God, right off we should realize that this is a message from God Almighty to each and every one of us. And when we realize that how much God loves us, thank you, Pastor, and uh, how much he loves us, we will understand that what God is really trying to do is restore a relationship with him. He's trying to restore a relationship. And uh, God, he communicates his love to us in so many different ways. But one of the main ways that he communicates his love is through this word right here. John, you know what John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through his son may be saved. Now, to me, that's love. That's love. Here is God, the creator of the whole universe. And we know that the universe is vast. We saw that teaching by Giglio, how vast the universe is. Now, but here's the creator of the universe, God himself. He left heaven, stepped into his own creation, and died for somebody else, somebody else's sin. Now, that's love. He didn't have to leave heaven, but he left that because he wants a relationship with us and he wanted us to be saved. Now, in our minds, we can't think of any other way possible that we could have been saved. We can't think of any other way. But God knew what he was doing. And God did that. And he did it for me, and he did it for each and every one of you. Now, in John, 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father had bestowed upon us? that we should be called sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Now, that says a whole lot to me. As Christian folks, the world don't know us. We know the world, but they don't know us because they don't know God. You can't know the Father without knowing his children. You can't know the children of God without knowing the Father. Now, 
the world, they are his children too, don't get me wrong. But they're not serving him. We are. That's why they don't know us. Now, it's about understanding, getting understanding. Now, when we seek understanding of the Bible, we seek understanding of this word just like a, a mechanic would try to seek understanding from a, a manual. Now, a mechanic, he knows his job, but there are certain times when he get caught between a rock and a hard place. And he's got to go to that manual to get understanding of what he's trying to fix. Because we know that things are going to go wrong in this world. Everything ain't going to be perfect. And just like that repair manual, this is our repair manual, this word. This word uh, diagnosed the problem. A lot of times that problem is sin. But this manual will also point out the solution to that problem. And the solution to that problem is our faith in Christ. That's the solution to any problem we might have. But God put it in his word. We can read it. We can go to it. This manual. Getting understanding. Now, the Bible tells us that for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Now, let's look at that a little bit closer. For the wages of sin is death. Y'all get that? The wages of sin is death. Let's say you got a job. You work five days a week. On that Friday, you're going to get a check. That's your wages. You're going to get paid for what you just did. Okay? Now, for the wages of sin is death. So if you're sinning, you're going to get paid. You're going to still get some wages. You know, so the best thing for you to do is not to sin. Like Pastor said, you don't get up every morning I know and say, I'm going to sin three times a day. <laughs> you know, but the, so the wages of sin is, is death. Getting understanding. That's what we're talking about, getting understanding. Now, we seek understanding of the Bible the same way that a, a driver in a car would seek understanding of a traffic signal. Now, would any of you run a, through a red light? No. Because you don't know what's on the other side of that light. You could kill yourself if you run that light, or you could kill somebody else if you run through that light. Now, the Bible does the same thing. It gives us the guidance that we need to go through life. It gives us the, uh, it shows us the road of safety that we should take. It shows us the wisdom that we need, and it shows us that when we get to a red light of sin, we need to come to a complete stop. We need to stop and evaluate the problem. What I'm saying is this. We come to the red light of sin. We evaluate the problem by saying, what's the consequence if I do this? What's the price I got to pay if I do this? If I commit this sin, what's the consequence? It's like reaping what you sow or cause and effect. So when you get to that red light of sin or when we get to that red light of sin, we have to come to a complete stop, evaluate the consequences, and then go on through that light. Not the light of sin, but go on through that light of righteousness. Getting understanding. We also seek understanding of the Bible for the same reason that somebody that's, say, caught up in a storm wants to understand the weather report. Now, the Bible predicts a whole lot of things. The, the Bible predicts what the end times are going to be like. Now, when I say the Bible predicts these things, I'm not saying that the Bible said, well, this is sort of like what it's going to be like, or it might be this way. Uh-uh. No, the Bible gives us a clear warning of every judgment that's found in this life. 
And uh, it's, you can find a lot of that stuff in Matthew 24, 25. But most importantly, the Bible tells us how to avoid things. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. We know if we walk after the flesh, there's going to be some serious consequences. Because the Bible says this, there is no good thing in the flesh. Ain't no good thing in this right here. We have to try and walk in the spirit. And to walk in the spirit, we need to get this word in us. That way we can walk in the spirit and not in the, in, in, into the flesh. Getting understanding. Now in the Bible, we seek understanding of the Bible for the same reason that a reader would seek understanding of his favorite book, which, by the way, should be the Word of God. That should be our favorite book. That should be everybody's favorite book is the Word of God. You see, the Bible reveals things to us about God. It reveals God's person. It reveals to us God's glory. And all that is expressed through his Son, Jesus Christ which is a carbon copy of the Lord. Now, the more we read, the more we understand. And the more we understand, the closer we come to that Arthur, which is God himself, getting understanding. Now, here's what the Bible says in Hebrews 2, 16 through 18. For as we all know, he, they're talking about Jesus, did not take hold of angels, talking about fallen angels here, to give them a helping and delivering hand. But he did take hold of the fall, fallen descendants of Abraham to reach out to them a helping hand and a delivering hand. Now that tells me that when them angels fell out of heaven, God didn't give them a helping hand and say, okay, boys, here's what we're going to do. You made a mistake. Come on back into the fold. No, he didn't do that. But to fallen man who's made in his image, the descendants of Abraham, that's us, he gives a helping hand. And that helping hand can be seen right here in this word. The helping hand of God. 17 says, so it is evident that it was essential that he be made like his brethren in every respect in order that he might become a merciful sympathetic and faithful high priest in the things related to God to make atonement and appropriation for the people's sin. Now, Jesus Christ was made exactly like us when he came to this earth. He was a man. He was a man. Even though he was God, he was a man. He came to this earth, he emptied himself. Before he came, to, he emptied himself. So he was a man. He felt everything that we feel. He went through everything that we're going through. So that way, he knows what it is when we hurt. He knows what it is when we are in, in sorrow. He knows what it is to be neglected. He knows because he's been through it all. Because he was a man. The Bible just said that. He was made like us in every respect. God said that. So that's true. That's truth. 18 says, for because he himself in his humanity, talking about Jesus now being as a human being, had suffered in being tempted, he had suffered in being tested and tried, that he was able or he is able immediately to run and cry and assist us and relieve us when we're being tempted or when we're being tested. See, he's able to relieve us. Of, of, we just got to put our faith in him. We have to put our faith in him. So, in essence, when we're tempted, we know Jesus was tempted by the same temptations that we are going through, Jesus overcame it. 
his spirit living inside of us so we can overcome it too. No problem. We can overcome it. You know, but we get downtrodden sometimes. Don't the Bible say, cheer up, I have overcome the world? So, cheer up. We can overcome anything that Jesus overcame because he lives in us and we in him. Now, it's very important for us to recognize that uh, nobody fully understands the depth and the riches found in this word right here. Nobody fully understands it. Nobody. Because, see, this Bible right here, this is a revelation. This is God's revelation of himself to us. This is his revelation of himself to us. And since God is infinite, that means that his knowledge is infinite. Now, that word infinite, that means unbounded or unlimited, boundless, endless, like God's infinite mercy. Now, that's just one definition of many because God's knowledge is immeasurable. You can't measure his knowledge. Now, our minds are finite. That means we have boundaries. We have limits. Our minds are measurable. So we can't even put ourselves on the same level with God, but his spirit lives in us. You know, his spirit lives, it don't live in the ant. It don't live in the elephant. It lives in us. We were made in the image of God. Get an understanding. And in all reality, that makes us very, very incapable of fully understanding the depth of the truth. Now, we can understand some truth, but the depth of the truth, what God understands, we can't fully understand that. Romans 11, 32, 34 says it best. It says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the man of the Lord? <laughs> That's a good question, isn't it? Who has known the man of the Lord? Nobody. Nobody knows the man of the Lord. Or who has been his counselor? Ain't nobody counsel God. You can't nobody counsel God. He's the creator. He was here in the beginning. And God also reminds us through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 55, 9, that as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. With that said, we are capable of understanding some of the basic doctrines of this Bible and some of the knowledge of God, but we understand it because he's already made it clear to us. He's made that clear to us. It says that in Romans 1.19, which says, they know the truth about God because he had made it obvious to them. You see... We haven't re received the spirit of the world, but we received the spirit of God. That we might know the things that God has freely given us and told us in this word. And these things that we know, we speak. But not in the words of uh, a man's wisdom or a man's teaching. We don't speak these things. We speak these things through the Holy Spirit. What the Holy Spirit teaches. Comparing spiritual things to spiritual things. Because the Bible says that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. We're natural people, but we have to walk in the Spirit. And if we walk in the Spirit... We can receive the things of God. But if we walk in the natural, we ain't going to receive nothing from God.
because the natural man think that the things of God is foolishness. That's what the natural man thinks. The things of God is foolishness. Because they are not spiritually discerned. Let me elaborate on that a little bit. Okay. Uh, before we all came to Christ, somebody, well, I'm just going to use myself. Before I came to Christ, I thought this was a bunch of foolishness. But when God get hold of you, you know better. This is the real deal. I can't do without it. And you know what? I had to separate myself from a lot of folks because my conversation now has got God in it. My conversation's got God in it. God provided this word, and he provided everything that we needed for our salvation and for our godly living. It's all right here in this word. But sometimes we, as human beings, we live in confusion. Now, I'm not saying that God is a God of confusion, because he's not. God is a God of peace. And God makes things so simple. He makes it so simple. He even made it simple for us on how to be saved. He made that so simple. There was a question asked uh, that was what was needed in order to be saved. This was asked of Paul and Silas. And they made it very clear in Acts 16.31, which says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. Now, ain't that simple enough? That's all you got to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Believe that Jesus Christ came to the earth, died on the cross, resurrected on the third day, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand side of God. That's the gospel in a nutshell. If you believe that, you'll be saved. But sometimes that's so hard for us to do because we don't understand. We don't have understanding. Now, the Bible says that God chose us before the foundation of the world. He chose us before the foundation of the world. Okay, who's us? In my mind, that's every human being on the face of the earth. Every human being on the face of the earth, not just Christian folk, but he's talking about everybody. He chose everybody before the foundation of the world. And if that wasn't true, he never would have said in his word that it's his will that no man perish. So he chose everybody. And he left everything else up to us. See, we had that right to choose. We have that right to choose, you know, and uh, with that ability to choose, we have the ability to understand this word, and we have the ability not to understand this word. But God left that up, uh, up to us. In John 6, 28 to 29, Jesus was asked, what must we do to do the works that God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Simple enough. Who did he send? He sent Jesus. So if you believe in the one he sent, you're doing all right. Getting understanding. Getting understanding. Now, understanding don't save us. That don't save us. Because we are saved through our faith in Christ, which is the one that God sent. That's how we're saved. Now, genuine faith will result in a more understanding of God's word as we grow in Christ. Because the author of scripture, which is the Holy Spirit, 
dwells right here in our hearts. And he's going to lead us in every and all truth, the Holy Spirit. That's his job. That's why my prayer is when I get up in the morning and I get down on my knees and I humble myself before God, my prayer is, Holy Spirit, lead me this day in righteousness. This day in righteousness. Not tomorrow, because I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. But I done woke up this morning, so lead me this day in righteousness. You know, now, pastor tells us all the time, when it comes to scripture, he tells us that discernment is extremely important when we're reading this word of God. So, to me, it would be very wise that when we study the Bible, regardless of which translation that you choose, me, myself, I find it wise for me to pray and ask God to give me understanding of what I'm reading. Because I want to understand it. Yeah, I want uh, revelation and wisdom, but moreover, I want to understand it. I want to understand what I'm reading. I don't want to be like the Sadducees. You remember when Jesus told them in Matthew 22, 29, that they were in error because they didn't know the scriptures or the power of God? And, and uh, their error is like a lot of people when they rely on their own power to interpret scripture. You can't interpret no scripture on your own power. Who you think you are? You know, you, we, we can't in, interpret scripture on our own power. We have to interpret scripture through the one that wrote it. That's who interprets it for us. The Bible didn't say that... Uh, Paul wrote the scriptures. The Bible didn't say that Moses wrote the scriptures. The Bible makes it perfectly clear that all scripture is God-breathed. God wrote the scriptures. Now, he used Paul and Moses, but he wrote it. God wrote the scriptures. So that makes us accountable, not to Paul. That makes us accountable, not to Moses. But it makes us accountable to the Lord for the use of these resources right here, which is his word. It makes us accountable to him, getting understanding. And when we have a respect and understanding of God's word, guess what? That word is going to produce a desire in our hearts to obey the Lord. It's going to put a desire in our hearts to obey the Lord, you know. Now, I'm going to ask you something. Do you have respect and understanding of God's word? Think about that. If you do, you promise a long life, strong confidence, and a place of refuge. If you have respect for this word right here. You see, when you keep God's word, it brings us under the umbrella of his protection. And that's where you want to be, under the umbrella, umbrella of his protection. Now, it's like going outside in the rain. If you go outside in the rain and you don't got an umbrella, you're going to get wet. But if you are under the un umbrella of God's protection, there's nothing that can touch you. But a lot of times, we don't understand the Bible because we are reluctant to accept what the Bible says. There's a whole lot of people like that. I used to be that way. I was reluctant to accept this word. Matthew 13, 15 says, Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their heart and turn so that I should heal them. Now, I'm sure that somebody in here right now knows somebody like that. As a matter of fact, some of y'all might have been like that once upon a time. I know I was. We just didn't want to hear anything about God. We didn't want to hear it.
please don't mention Jesus. You know? So it, was, it wasn't that we despised the word of God. The thing was, we wanted to do our own thing with no constraints. We didn't know, want no constraints on what we were doing. Bottom line, we just didn't want to be healed. We did not want to be healed. Getting understanding. So I think, you know, we all should take heed to the sound advice that the word gives us here in Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. It says this. Be careful then how you live. Now that's a mouthful. Be careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. The days are evil. We living in the last days. 20, 30 years ago, Everything's done change. I mean, people are getting crazier and crazier. They're doing some of the wildest. Anything that a man can conjure up in his mind that's evil, he'll do it. A man would do anything on the face of the earth if he's not serving God. We are living in evil times. Getting understanding. But by walking in God's path and truly worshiping God, we avoid all those traps that the devil are trying to set for us, which lead to death. You know, I said truly worshiping God. Now, a lot of people might think that singing gospel songs is truly worshiping God. Can you worship God while you're singing? Yeah, you can worship God while you're singing. But singing alone don't mean that you're worship, worshiping God. Praise is the same way. Worship and praise, they're both the attitudes of the heart. The attitudes of the heart. And these attitudes are demonstrated through our actions by being obedient to God and to his word. As a matter of fact, Obedience is the highest form of worship that we can give God, is obedience. Why do you think we in the shape, this world, well, this world is in the shape it is in today? Disobedient. It started in the garden. Disobedient. So obedience is the, the, the highest form of uh, worship that we can give God, just obeying Now, we can worship God and praise God while we are singing songs. We, we sing songs of the heart. The songs that we just sang were songs of the heart. And we were worshiping and praising God. However, the voice that God hears is the heart. He ain't listening to the words of that song. He listening to the heart. See, God looks at the inside of the cup. He ain't looking at the outside of the cup. He's looking at the inside of the cup. You know, God states in the Bible that there are a whole lot of folks that draw near to him with their lips. But their hearts are far from him. He said that. I ain't make that up. God calls these people hypocrites. I ain't make that up either. Matthew 15, 7 through 9 says, ye hypocrites. Well, the Isaiah prophesied to you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching doctrines and commandments of men. Boy, that's a mouthful right there. Now, I'm going to say this now. I'm not trying to put any other church down or anything like that. But there's a lot of churches that I've been in. They don't get what we get here. 
They don't get what we get here. I just read, but in vain, they do worship me, teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. We don't, we don't get doctrines of men here. We get the word of God here. Not doctrines of men, because doctrines of men ain't going to do nothing for you. It's the word of God. This is what we get here. Because the heart or the spirit of a man speaks louder than his word could ever speak. God looks at the heart. He ain't listening to the word. He hears the words, but he looks at the heart. I love you, Lord. He look at your heart. And if you lie, he know you lie. Because he's looking at your heart. You know? So he sees the heart of every man. I'm talking about every man on the face of the earth. Not just the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. He stated this to Samuel when he chose David to become the king over Israel. Although uh, Saul, now, on the outside, Saul looked like a king. You know, he had on his Gucci suit, you know, his flourishing shoes. He looked like a king on the outside, but God saw his heart. He saw the heart, and he anointed David to rule in his place because he saw the inside. And here's what the Lord said in 1 Samuel 16, 17. But the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord see it not as a man see it. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord look at the heart. Bottom line, without God, every man's on the face of the earth, his heart is wicked and deceitful without God. Every one of us in here, right here, right now, before we came to the Lord, our hearts were wicked and deceitful. Every one of us. You know I'm telling the truth. And we were that way because we didn't have understanding or we didn't read this word to get understanding. But once we read this word and God got a hold of us, our heart changed. But God did it. We didn't do it. God did it. Because God said, I will do a good work in you until the coming of the Lord. See, he changed us. You remember when Philip was traveling to Gaza and the Holy Spirit led him uh, to a man who was reading a portion of Isaiah? This is talking about getting understanding now. And Philip approached the man and uh, he saw what the man was reading and he asked the man an important question. He said, do you understand what you're reading? That's what he asked him. Now Philip knew that uh, understanding was the uh, starting point for faith. That's the starting point of faith, getting understanding. So without understanding the Bible, we can't apply it. Without understanding the Bible, we can't obey it. And without understanding the Bible, we can't even believe it. If you don't understand this, how are you going to believe it? You can't. But you got to understand it. So, to be as clear on this, John wrote, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Getting understanding. There's a whole lot of themes in the Bible that refer to Salvation. You know what they are? Believe. Believe. There, there's a whole lot of passages 
that uh, we probably don't understand, you know, but in our faith in Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior and as our personal Redeemer, we can continue to get more understanding as we read, as we study, and as we rely on the Holy Spirit to guide us in all truth. So, in summary, what's the proper way to study the Bible? We should study the Bible through prayer and humility. And we should rely on the Holy Spirit to give us the understanding of what we're reading. We should always study scripture in its context, recognizing that the Bible, it explains itself. It always explains itself. And we must remember that God is the author of this word, and he wants us to understand it. He wants us to understand it. And one of the most important things that we have to do is die to self. We have to die to self. Example. Let's say you put a, a, a dead body in front of me right here, right now. Now, I can spit on that body. I can slap that body. I can talk about that body. And guess what? That body ain't going to respond. It's not going to respond. Why? Because it's dead. It's a dead body. And that's the way we ought to be when it comes to self and to sin. But you know, self is so alive in us all. <laughs> it's so alive. You know, you see, we think sometimes that we do everything on our own without the help of God. Self. Because self thinks that self is in charge. You know, and, and uh, without God, ain't nothing we can do worthwhile. Nothing. Nothing we can do worthwhile. I can tell you that self ain't in charge of nothing. Now, if you think you're in charge, try this right here. Listen to me now. If you think you're in charge, try this. I want you to go to bed this morning at 1.15 a.m., okay? Then I want you to get up exactly at 3.27 a.m. If you're in charge, you can do that. Now, don't use an alarm clock. <laughs> but if you're in charge, do that. You can't do it. Some of us probably wouldn't even get up to 8, 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, God is in charge. God said, let there be light. Instantly, there was light. It didn't come two days down the road. It didn't come... Five minutes later, light probably came before he could get the words out of his mouth, you know, but God is in charge. And we have to realize that there is only one God, and we ain't him. A lot of people don't even read the Bible because of self. Self won't let them read it. And when they do read the Bible, they come up missing in action. Missing in action. If a lot of fathers spend a whole lot of time reading the Bible, they wouldn't leave their families. If a lot of mothers spent time in the Word, they wouldn't blame their mother for them not being able to raise their own children. We have to spend word in this Bible. We wouldn't be in bad shape. We, I mean, we would be in bad shape if God came up missing in action. We really would be in bad shape. So in essence, we have to learn how to rely on God. And how do we learn how to rely on God? By reading this word. 
Now, in closing, we should all be trying to please God and not men. As for me, I'm not trying to please no man. I'm not trying to please man. I'm like Paul when Paul said, if I was trying to please men, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. So I'm not trying to please men. I've come to the conclusion in my life that no matter how high I get in this life, I'm still going to be looking up to him. I'm still going to be looking up to him. And I'm going to leave you with this. If you can conceive it, you can achieve it. If you can see it, you can be it. One more thing. Remember this. If you don't remember nothing else that I said tonight, sin gives birth to death. Thank you.